historia de Chile. So these are your offices, the, the Breeders' Cup offices. Yes, and Jockey Club. And Jockey Club. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is exciting. It's cool to have it right in the city. Right? It is actually, and it's a great location. Um, I actually used to work at the NFL just a few blocks down. We were, we were, when I worked at the NFL, we were at 280 Park. Oh, that's so, so um, interesting. Yeah, now they're a bit further, um, further uptown. I did bring you, these are cookies from Horse Country in Virginia. Oh, wow. So I just thought you could have those Virginia when you Horse want. Horse Country, oh, that's, those look yeah, amazing. Right? My kids will love these. Hey, everybody, welcome to this episode of Lunch with Lindsay. So I am today sitting down with Lisa Lazarus. So Lisa um, is someone I met this past summer. I have loved covering the sport of horse racing. And Lisa is the CEO of the Horse Racing Integrity and Safety Authority, otherwise known as HISA, right? So Lisa uh, launched the racetrack safety program as well as the anti-doping program within the sport. And really she is tasked with safeguarding the sport of horse racing and really implementing this protocol to have an opportunity to protect and save the sport because a lot of people believe that horse racing has got to evolve in order to really maintain its existence. We know that what's paramount is the safety of these race horses and preventing these horses from going down and of course any fatalities around the tracks, around the races. Um, so Lisa has been an executive at many different places along the years. One of them is the NFL. I loved hearing about her journey and what's led her to this point and what she's doing to implement these new measures and the challenges she faces with that. We began though this conversation with her childhood and how her, um, her specific experience with her family really shaped and molded her into the woman that she is, the mom that she is, and the leader that she is currently. I was definitely um, a people pleaser. I was definitely a hard worker. I was competitive, you know, but I was also um, kind of a caregiver to my sisters. My mom was diagnosed with breast cancer when I was about nine, and she had, you know, good periods and, and, and more challenging periods. And I have two younger sisters. One is four years younger than me, one's okay. eight years younger than me. And so I definitely, uh, you know, spent a fair amount of time kind of, you know, mentoring them, helping them, being there for them. And then she ultimately passed away um, when she was 44. I was 21 and my sisters were 17 and 13. So I've always kind of had this like, you know, sort of supportive, nurturing relationship with my sisters. I guess I would say, like, in addition to being competitive and social, I was also, I think, you know, sort of maternal and nurturing. Um, wow. Yeah. What was that time period like for you? So, you know, there was... Because they were still in school. Also, yeah. You know, and that's when she ultimately passed away, I was in college, and that was a really weird time because the juxtaposition of, like, the fun and the parties and the, like, excitement of being, like, an emancipated adult... Yeah. juxtaposed with like the difficulty that was happening at home for my family and I was going back and forth a lot um, in that last year before she passed away that was really difficult um, but then I ultimately moved home for a year home being Montreal where my family was um, after university and and was really there for my for my sisters and I've always been very close to my sisters but I think I think that experience definitely made me uh, in some ways a bit of a leader because I always took the lead in my family um, yeah but also very empathetic. And I think I try to use like that empathy um, in, in my jobs always in this one in particular because there's a lot of change for a lot of people and I try to just be sensitive and, and empathetic to what they're going through because you never know what somebody is going through. You never know mm -hmm. like their pain points and you never really know um, you know their challenges. So that's always on my mind. What, what did you learn from your mom? One of the things, there's so many things that I learned from my mom. She was an incredible person. She was unbelievably strong. But one of the things she used to always say to me that I always remember is, well, two things. One is she would say, when I was growing up, we had two choices, to be mm -hmm. a teacher or a nurse. And you can be whatever you oh, want to be. Crazy. You know? Yeah. You can be anything you want to be. And I have two sisters, and she would always say that. You'd be whatever you want to be. And, um, and she also would always say, you know, never depend on a man, like always have your own financial independence, you know. Um, and I took that to heart also. I mean, I have a great husband and I've been married more than 20 years, but I, uh, but I always, you know, I, I always felt like I needed to have my own career, my own identity, and, and be whatever I wanted to be. And, and that was very much like her narrative. And I think she would have loved to have done something different. She was a teacher, she loved it. Yeah. But, but I think she always felt like she didn't have, I mean, I know she felt she didn't have those choices. And she also 
taught me about, um, you know, I'm always, I, I, I'm not someone who, I'm not a complainer, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I'm not someone who, um, who sort of pontificates around, around everything that went wrong or, or mulls over things that didn't go quite your way. I'm always a, let's just move forward and do the best we can and kind of accept our circumstances. And she was very much that way. She never, you know, I never remember her prying or making us feel, but I'm sure she cried a lot in, in private. Yeah. But to, our, to myself, my sisters, she kept like a happy home and she was always optimistic and she never um, made it seem or communicated that her life was tragic in any way. You know, she mm -hmm. was always about all the gifts she'd been given and all the positive things and, and about the future. And I think that's very much stayed with me as well, is that I'm not, you know, I'm somebody who's sort of always like, focused on the good. People laugh at me, they say like, I'm so glass half full, always, even in the craziest circumstances. Really? Like, yeah, my husband is always like, seriously. Um, but I'm just <laughs> always, like I just always see, it just generally, it, it, it's a very authentic reaction. It's not manufactured. Yeah. I just always see, I just always feel so blessed. Like we live in, we live in an amazing country. We have all these opportunities, we live in a democratic country. I mean, we have, I, you know, I have food to eat. I, like there's just nothing I can really complain about. And the things that, um, that are challenging, you just gotta kinda go forward and, and meet them head on. I love that. So you're, you are working in the sport that your dad is mainly responsible for introducing yeah. you to, but it's some of really your mom's like, heart and yeah. guidance that's yeah. kind of absolutely coming to the surface. Absolutely, I think about her all the time, and I really do, and I do feel like she's sort of my guiding light. So I'm so excited to sit down with you, mm -hmm. and I, you know, to talk about what you're doing with HISA, which is the Horse Racing Integrity and Safety Authority, but right. also your story as an executive, as a woman, and what you're doing now. Um, mm -hmm. I really want to hear a lot about that too, and the thing yeah. is I was, Coming down here on the train, I was thinking when my dad was covering horse racing, which is mm -hmm. definitely part of the reason that I yeah. really have a passion for mm -hmm. it, um, HISA didn't exist. Yeah. There was no regulatory body. Right. And so to think about the changes and the reason for those changes, mm -hmm. I, I am excited for people that pay attention to this yeah. to learn more from you right. about mm -hmm. this. I think the importance of HISA and having a national governing body um, has sort of been in the background in horse racing for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think the people that were sort of doing, you know, th the business of horse racing day to day, you know, they didn't, they didn't necessarily think about it in the wider context. A lot of the folks who are kind of driving the business, kind of creating the strategy, often came back to this question of, you know, why are we so different from other sports in this way? You know, why is our sport regulated from state to state? You know, why in the Triple Crown? When we go from you know Kentucky to to uh, to Maryland to to New York, we, we have different rules. Yeah, and Triple Crown referencing the um, Kentucky Derby, the Preakness, and then the Belmont yes, States. Correct. And so what you're saying is it it's not ruled and regulated by the same no. governing body at yes, all. Yes, exactly. Well, it wasn't, and now of course yeah. it is. But you know, the year prior to HISA coming into effect. Uh, you know, you would ha you had different rules in those three states, and so that's just so odd to anybody who's really a sports fan. And I think that you know, for a long time, folks realized that coming together under one entity would be really impactful for everyone. Um, it just took a little bit of time to make it happen. <laughs> and it, and not everyone's there yet. And not right? everyone's there. I mean, it's happened, but not right. everyone f fully embraces it or has really. Not everyone has accepted it, and you know it's a it's a transition period. Yeah. So before we kind of get into the the depth of all the things, sure. where where are things now? How would you describe? So Heiser runs two programs. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we're I think you you know as you're aware, the federal government passed the Horse Racing Integrity and Safety Act at the end of December 2020. It was a bipartisan initiative. You know you had. Charles Schumer and you had Mitch McConnell, um, who together you know brought the bill forward. It had a tremendous amount of sponsors, um, you know, passed quite easily, and it gave HISA really two areas of responsibility. You know, one is racetrack safety and all that encompasses, including the safety of the riders and the jockeys, and the other is the anti-doping and medication control program, mm -hmm. which is you know obviously regulating substances of abuse in horses, and so. We launched the racetrack safety program first, and that was in July of 2022. And then we only launched the anti-doping program in May of this year, May of 2023. So I think, you know, there have been a bunch of lawsuits challenging our constitutionality and stuff. And so I think when we first launched, 
there was a little bit of a question amongst some folks who work in horse racing, is this really here to stay? Do I need to embrace it? Do I need to learn it? It's a new system. Um, or can I kind of pretend it's not happening and see where we end up? And, and not to interrupt, but sure. because I think this is context, and it was created in response to yes. Santa Anita. Yeah, for sure. Is that right? All well, the you know, I think it was created in response to a lot of different sort of horse welfare issues and questions, and also around anti-doping. But certainly, you know, the, the, the injuries that took place in 2019 in Santa Anita were kind of, let's call it the straw that broke the camel's back. Congress realized, really Mitch McConnell, who of course is, you know, a senator from Kentucky where horse racing is such, so part of the fabric of yeah. the state, realized, you know, if we don't actually act now, we may not have the sport for the future. Our children and grandchildren may not be able to enjoy the sport the way that we have. And so I think that motivated a number of different um, legislators to get involved and to push it forward. Of course, in New York, you've got the history of the Belmont, Aqueduct, Saratoga, and so, um, of course, Senator Schumer, I think, responded for that reason. And, um, and so we created this, you know, this national governing body, and we set to work. And in the beginning, you know, there are those who absolutely think Haiza is you know, the most important change in our industry in, in forever and, and is, are fully supportive. But there are those who understandably you know, aren't sure and have been doing the same thing their whole lives and don't necessarily understand the reason or the need for a change. And so a lot of what we've been doing has just been education. In the beginning, there was definitely a fair amount of resistance. But I have to say, while there are definitely you know, still those who oppose HISA, the, the number of people who oppose it and the strength of, of that opposition has really decreased very substantially, you know, as it's kind of just become, started to become part of the norm and part of the fabric. And as the industry has realized that it actually brings a lot of very, very positive things and not a whole lot of negative. You know, I think there was a fear that this is going to, you know, change horse racing forever. It's going to negatively impact certain elements of the business. And that just hasn't happened. And because of that, I think we've gotten a lot more support. Horse racing is definitely an industry um, where a lot of times your father did it, your grandfather did it, maybe your great-grandfather or great-grandmother, and so there's a historical connection and there's a sentimentality around it. And I think anything that you know, changes that in a substantial way is scary for people. You know, they, is my way of life going to change? You know, am I still going to be able to support my family doing the sport? Like, what does this mean for me? Mm -hmm. And am I going to be able to, you know, are these rules going to be too onerous for me? Can I still, you know, do what I've always done under these set of rules? And I think as time has gone on, folks have realized that actually there's a whole lot of positive that comes out of this, um, particularly around uniformity. And, and really that the things that were really critically important for them, but the core of what they do really hasn't changed. I think the kind of temperature has really settled quite a bit um, and allowed us to, to do what we're doing. And to be honest, you know, we launched this whole program with like a blank piece of paper. Like we built, you know, when I was hired, you know, there was, there was, there was like one employee and that's it. And I had to like, you know, call to get my laptop. I mean, so we really <laughs> built it from scratch. And so every day we're making things better. Like it wasn't perfect when we launched it, you know. Yeah. We have to see some of these things, we have to see how they work. And do they have the same intended consequence or effect that we had hoped it, you know, that rule or that program did? And if they don't, then we tweak it and we try to figure out what, what we got wrong. Mm -hmm. And so because you know, time has just made the program, what we're doing, stronger. And the people who have become part of my team and part of the overall teams that are delivering the services are, are just are so passionate and so loyal and so um, committed to making this industry the best that it can be. I think there's been a recognition of that, you know, within the industry. You have changed jobs, but kept extremely meaningful positions several times. Mm -hmm. And when you mentioned that part of that was because of going overseas, going with yeah. your husband, following yeah. mm -hmm. his job, can yeah. you share that again? Yeah, I think that's sure. Really, really so, cool. you know, I'm a lawyer by training, and so, you know, after law school, I went to work for a big law firm, Aiken Gump, Strauss, Hauer, and Feld, and I was fortunate while I was there, really by happenstance, to have my first assignment be for the NFL. And, um, you know, worked super hard on it, you know, back in those days, really trying to impress. And um, I was lucky that the partner felt comfortable with my work, um, the partner in charge of the NFL business. Mm -hmm. And so kept giving me assignments for, for the NFL. And so, you know, by the time I was in my second year, 90, 95% of my work was for the NFL. And so about four years into to my time at, at the law firm, 
uh, and a position opened up at the NFL that was an in-house position in their legal department. And so I decided to, to leave um, the law firm and I was fortunate enough to get the job. And in that job I was um, working for the NFL Management Council, which is essentially the corollary to the union, um, to the Players Association. And I was basically, you know, working to support the teams and any disputes with the players and stuff. Yeah. The management council is al almost like a little law firm for the teams um, on player-related issues. So I was loving my job and um, couldn't have asked for anything, anything more, anything better. But my husband got an opportunity to um, to move to Singapore with his job, and I had just gotten pregnant with our first child and. I kind of, we talked about it and we sort of weighed pros and cons and we thought, okay, this will be a great experience and a great adventure. So I decided to leave my job um, at the NFL. They ended up keeping me on for some international projects, but I left that management council job. Okay. Um, and then when we were overseas, I, I was approached about being the general counsel of the International Equestrian Federation, which is, you know, the Olympic horse sports primarily, and took that job in Lausanne, Switzerland, because um, we moved from Singapore to Geneva. And, um, and love that. And so that's when I really got entrenched in, in sort of horse sports and mm -hmm. the horsey world, as we like to say, um, and learned all about you know, anti-doping and horses and, and horse welfare and, and all of that. And so you know, that was certainly, I think, what made me prepared for this job um, you know, a number of years later. What struck you about what you were learning about the anti-doping situation mm -hmm. and, and just that whole side of, of horse racing? You know, when I um, joined the FEI, which is the acronym for the International Question Federation, it's, a, it's in French, um, they had just come out of the Beijing Olympic Games. Um, so this would have been you know, back in 2008. Mm -hmm. uh, it was 2009 when I joined there, but it was just, just following the Beijing Olympic Games. And there'd been a number of positive tests in horses, and there was a question around whether or not you know that was going to create a problem with the International Olympic Committee in terms of keeping okay. um, uh, horse sports in the Olympic program. And so I was hired to sort of come in and really revamp the program, which is what we did, and made it essentially you know a far more rigorous program, but using the World Anti-Doping Code as sort of the framework or the foundation. Um, it was, you know, we had 133 countries, mm -hmm. and it was certainly in, you know, multitude of languages, obviously, and so it was certainly a challenge to get that rolled out, to, to educate everyone about what the program, you know, comprised of, how it was going to operate. Um, but what's funny, I, I like to joke that, you know, as hard as the 133 countries were, um, you know, the, the various states that we have involved in horse racing are even more, <laughs> even more challenging in a lot of ways. But ultimately, I'm doing in a lot of ways the same thing for horse racing that I did back in 2009, 2010 for the FEI. Okay, like what? Which, like is, bringing in, which is bringing in an, an equine anti-doping program mm -hmm. that's completely different from what everyone's used to, you mm -hmm. know? That essentially is, puts a lot more um, sort of onus on trainers and people involved in horse racing to have practices and to have procedures that are really focused on making sure that nothing comes into the horse's system that shouldn't. Um, but we also have sort of safeguards in place to try to make sure that there aren't contamination issues and that we're really trying to kind of yeah. get at the cheating or the, or the conduct we want to get rid of. Um, and it's hard to create a program that does all of those things. Um, but I think the World Anti-Doping Code has you know, so many years of, of history now that it's been, been in effect and we can really kind of learn from that and learn from my FEI experiences about how to kind of have the best program. What is it like and I guess what are things that you have to deal with when there are like provisional suspensions, sure. right? And that situation right. comes up knowing, knowing that trainers, if someone is yeah. impacted financially, sure. they could lose yeah. everything, right? Sure. So where are you with that? These things are really, they're really difficult questions and they're philosophical questions. and. Um, the provisional suspension is a, is a relatively new concept in horse racing. There is something called a summary suspension that some okay. states were using for really egregious conduct. Um, but the provisional suspension is, is, a, is a new concept. And the idea behind it, I think is important to explain, is that it only applies to the doping substances. It doesn't apply to medication overages. So trainers will use things in horses, as you know, between races that are perfectly fine, like Advil, like, like a human might use Advil. Okay. No problem, you're completely allowed that. Just can't have it in the horse system during a race. So this, the provisional suspension does not apply to those types of cases. It only applies to what we call the doping substances. Things that are really intended to change the performance of the horse and give it an advantage. So the theory is that if we 
find a trainer who's using one of those more serious substances with a positive test, um, and the B sample comes back and confirms that positive test, or the trainer says, I don't want the B sample because, yeah, I did use that, um, then whether we look at it as that, our program is destined, is sort of is designed, not destined, is, and also destined, is designed to protect um, the trainers who aren't cheating, you know, the ones who are following the rules, and basically the greater good of the industry. So the equation becomes, am I better off, essentially is telling that trainer, you got to wait this out a bit while we figure out what really happened here, um, so that I'm protecting the 99.9% .9 of the other trainers who didn't, you know, who didn't cheat, who didn't, who didn't make a mistake, who didn't do the wrong thing. Am I better off saying, we're so worried about your rights and your due process that go back into the pool. It doesn't matter what happens to betters or, or, or you know, or trainers that are competing against you, because you can't unwind that clock, you know, especially when it comes to, to, to betting. They don't change paramutuals and payouts based on the horse testing positive down the road. The trainer whose horse tested positive will lose the purse, will lose the prize money, but that's not the same as the gambling public, right? So we have an obligation to protect everyone involved. And so that's, the, that's essentially the calculation we make is it's more important for the greater good that we put this person aside. The way that I like, I like to kind of explain it in an analogy that I think resonates with people is that if you're in a company and you suspect that your accountant is embezzling money, but you're not sure yet, you don't let them manage your money for the next three months while you, while you look into it. You say, okay, mm -hmm. you know what, administrative leave, you gotta sort of go to the side, we're going to figure this out as soon as possible. We, we'll either, you know, exonerate you or we won't. But we're not going to let you engage, you know, continue to engage in that activity that we have really that we have serious concerns about until we know what what's going on. It's not a finding of guilt. It doesn't mean we, you know, it just basically means you got to hold for for a little bit while we figure this out. And and if trainers have an explanation or something that they can tell us very quickly. We react very quickly. Like we've had a couple situations where we've gotten information within 24, 48 hours, we've lifted the suspension because we've realized that there were some extenuating circumstances. And even if we don't drop the case, if if the trainer gives us enough information to think, you know what, there really is a risk that they're going to win their case at the end. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to take that risk by suspending them during the interim period. So we let them go back to work. It's only when we really believe that it's very likely to be, you know, a positive case through the end. Um, that we make that kind of balancing equation of we got to protect, mm -hmm. you know, the trainers who are competing clean. So when you were offered this job, mm -hmm. what, how did that conversation go down? Yeah. What was that like? I saw it as an opportunity to really do something meaningful, you know, because the way that it was presented to me was horse racing is an incredible sport. It's the oldest American sport. It's been around forever, um, but it's somewhat in crisis. And now we have this statute, this law. And if we do things properly and we get it right, we can safeguard the sport forever, essentially, for years and years to come. And so that, to me, you know, was an incredibly enticing um, challenge, mission, and then the chance to sort of build my own team um, was really exciting because, you know, I'm sure you know, like, at the end of the day, almost everything in life that you're good at comes down to the people. Yes, you're amen. The, you know what I mean? Like, that's 100%. It's the people, right? So if you got the right people, and you if you can, can get that lesson in. early, you're a lot better off. <laughs> a lot better, <laughs> right? Off, a lot better off. So it's true. Um, so you know, I don't have. Um, I have a lot of experience in horse sports and with these kind of legal issues around horses. Yeah. I don't come from racing. So I surrounded myself with people who come from racing. And what was your view of it? I, I want to hear everything. So you know, it's funny. It. My view of it was um, I did go to the race track a lot with my father when I was growing up. Um, he's a huge horse racing fan, and I think, you know, you kind of had this perception of it's the sport of your fathers and grandfathers or, or grandmothers and grandfathers. Yeah. Um, and so I thought of it as okay, this is an amazing sport. You know, there may be a little bit of corruption there. There may be some, you know, some cheating we need to deal with. But ultimately, it's a really beautiful sport. You sort of, you think of Secretariat. You think mm -hmm. of, you know, all these amazing horses that, that came before. And, and so there's a, there's a desire to kind of protect that, but also to bring it into, you know, the modern world, so to speak. And so yeah. my perception of it was it's an incredible sport, but it needs to, to kind of have some reorganization, some rethinking, particularly around safety and integrity. And if we can get those things right, we really have the chance to, to protect the sport for a long time. And to, and to also, I really believe, um, we're not there yet, but if we do our job properly, as in Haiza, myself and my team, 
we should dramatically impact the economics of the sport. You know, and the way that I look at it is that Haiza should be like this, this sort of veneer, this covering around the sport that protects it. We're not the story. We should never be the story. Mm -hmm. The story is the horses and the racetracks and the races, but we should be the thing in the background that allows the story to be front and center so that you're not talking about horses getting hurt or horses, or horses dying. You're talking about that incredible race with that amazing story of how that jockey, you know, fought all this opposition and made it to the, to the Kentucky Derby. And that horse, nobody, you know, somebody bought for $20,000 at a sale and didn't think it could be anything. But you've got Jenna Antonucci working with that horse. Mm -hmm. And, you know, those are the stories. And I don't see Haiza as the story. I see it as the thing that allows the story to be what everybody focuses on. You know? What level of crisis do you think the sport is or was in? So, you know, funny enough, things got worse before they got better, right? Um, so I do think the sport is in crisis. I do. I think we're, listen, I think there's so much evidence that there's still a lot of belief and passion in the sport. You know, you look at the sales, you know, and how mm -hmm. successful they've been recently. And you wonder, like, what's that disconnect with the difficult year we've had? And the truth is that I think what that means, you know, when you buy a weanling, you buy a yearling, you're kind of buying a dream. People, for the most part, still have that dream. The sport is going to be, you know, what, it, what it's always been or what it once was. But it's a tipping point. And I really believe that if the industry doesn't come together and really work together on addressing these issues, that we, that there really is a threat that we won't be around in the future. And when you said that it got wor it got worse then after it got better, that was because Santa Anita and the horse horses going down there and then it was getting fixed, the problem, and then at Churchill Downs, you had the 12 right. horses go down, Churchill right? Downs I just want for context. Downs. Yes, no, that's exactly right. Sorry, I should have explained no, 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 that. No, 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 you're right. I mean, and the truth is that, you know, I just got an email about, uh, from, from our sort of team in Ohio saying that fatalities in Ohio are the lowest they've been in the last 10 years. We started off by putting our resources in those racetracks that aren't on NBC or aren't on Fox or aren't on America's Best Racing, you know what I mean? Yeah. That are kind of, you know, more in the shadows, but where there was, there was a significant opportunity to make very quick progress. And so it's, you know, it's obviously a little bit frustrating for me because I think we've done, we've done a lot of really positive things in all, some of the states that don't get a lot of publicity. But when you have um, breakdowns, when you have injuries and fatalities and high profile races, um, that certainly you know, changes the perception of the public. And, and the truth is that it shouldn't, you know, it shouldn't happen. It really should never happen. You shouldn't have those types of injuries. You know, there's enough checks and balances, there's enough scrutiny, there's enough things that we can do mm -hmm. um, to prevent that. And, you can't necessarily prevent every single one because horses are live beings, just like you can't prevent humans from getting injured. We've got to take what we've learned um, this year and really motivate, be motivated and focused on you know, genuine improvement and having conversations that are hard conversations that the industry hasn't had before. You know, What are some of the hardest conversations? You know, I think conversations around I think the emphasis for a long time, and I hear this a lot when I try to talk. You know, the one thing I'm never, people always laugh at me because I'm never scared of going into a very hostile environment because I just want to, you know, it's not, I know it's not me personally, and I just want to know, if people are upset, I want to know why. I want to know if we can fix it. Yeah. Sometimes I go into situations, people say, I don't want the federal government, you know, in my horse business, and I can't fix that. That's just a, and we're not, we're obviously not a federal, federal agency, we are a private entity. That's a, that's a political view that is sort of on the sidelines. When I come in and, I, and people say, you know, they give me really good sort of training reasons about why and, and horse-centric reasons about what something isn't working, I really listen to that. And um, I think for a long time, all of the advancements in horse safety were on the trainer and the veterinarians, you know, on, were on kind of stricter veterinary protocols. Yeah. We need those. They're important. We're still looking at that. But we need to now look at other places too because these, these, these injuries are, we always say they're multifactorial and they are because they're caused by a lot of different data points. Track surfaces. Right, well We've Churchill was that. investigated for that very thing. 100% and, and we gotta look at track surfaces, right? Yeah. Seriously, like what is, you know, can we make a difference there? Do we need to also put money into, you know, making our dirt surfaces better? Should we move more to synthetic? We, we need to really have conversations around that. We need to have conversations around 
you know, the sales, like for a horse from the, from the time that a horse kind of comes into fruition to the end, what are the things we need to put in place to protect those horses? You know, we need to have conversations around breeding. You know, is breeding, are we breeding a less durable but faster horse? Um, you know, you, you ask 10 trainers those questions, you get 10 different opinions, you know? So the truth is that we need to look at the data, we need to look at um, real studies uh, and, and, and sort of go from there. And so I think some of these conversations have not really taken place in earnest. And now with the industry facing what it is, all industry actors for the most part are, are like, I like to say all hands on deck, but I really do feel like that's how everyone feels now is that they're gonna have the hard conversations and we're gonna figure it out, you know? And then maybe that like a lot of our theories, maybe some of our theories are wrong, you know? But we have the ability to look at so much data now and analyze it and let the data kind of point us in the right direction. So using um, Santa Anita as an example, heading into the Breeders' Cup, what, what changes were instituted by HISA after it was created? So I'm gonna, the one thing I have to caveat a little bit is that um, California, after Santa Anita, at a time when the states could do whatever they wanted, state to state, prior to HISA, um, put in place a lot of changes a lot of very impactful changes. They did a really good job. I mean, they have dramatically lowered um, their fatality rate. And so a lot of the things that we ultimately took on board were some of the things that were already happening in California. So you see less of a change there, and you might in other states. But that being said, the changes are all the testing is uniform. So in the test barn, it's um, HISA personnel that's run by our anti-doping agency, HIWU, but essentially HISA personnel who are, you know, taking the samples, the samples are going to, you know, one of our certified labs, they're being analyzed according to, you know, the HISA, HIWU testing menu, and, and then they're being prosecuted in the same way that every other, every other, you know, case around the country is being prosecuted. So that, that's very uniform, it looks and feels the same from sort of racetrack to racetrack. Um, and then, you know, the, the focus on equine welfare and veterinary exams and all of that, you know, are very much in place as well. We have a, a crop rule um, that's standard across the country, you know, yep. which is um, very focused also on equine welfare. Crop and meaning the crops that the jockeys yeah, use sorry, on the, the horses. Yeah, mm -hmm. And yeah. so, and that rule now is a so certain rule amount is of that, times. Yeah, a jockey can, can use the crop a maximum of six, well, there's a few things. One is um, the equipment specifications. It's like a styrofoam. Yep. Um, so really, the impact on the horse, it's more for, hey, pay attention. It's not, this, it really doesn't hurt. I mean, if you took it and you, and you wrapped it yourself, you, wouldn't, you would feel very little. So, but they can still only use it six times and uh, in maximum. And also, they, have, they can't use it six times in a row. Every two uses of the crop, they have to get the, give the horse at least two strides to react. And you can't use it in the stretch if you're not in contention. So like to, to show frustration. Um, now you could potentially go over the six if it's generally a safety issue, like horses running into the rail or something's happening. Sure. Um, but in order to, as encouragement for the race, it's that, that's the maximum. That was a huge change for a lot of places. Did you consider eliminating the crop altogether? Because I mean, if, there's, if there are people out there that think that that's inhumane for whatever reason, there's always a discussion about that, but I think that um, the people who have those conversations also don't understand, you know, what a jockey face is, and yeah. it's basically for steering, you know? It'd be like if you took the steering wheel away from a car. Mm -hmm. You said mm -hmm. just, you know, play. now, of course, they have the reins and everything like that, but sometimes it's just need to show the, jo show the horse the crop to get the horse to pay attention, et cetera. So we think that that's the right balance. How much of you, when you really realized that you wanted this job and decided to take it. I mean, do you feel that this is an opportunity to save a sport? I absolutely do. Now, do I think it's an opportunity by myself to save it? No, you know, I need the team, I need the industry players and all of that. But can I be a really important force in leading the industry to the right place and, and my team? You know, absolutely. I, I really do because the thing, the, what HISA gives is um, the opportunity to obviously regulate in these areas that, you know, make everything uniform. But it also, it's like the only central, really central body, you know, in mm -hmm. horse racing. So it also is an opportunity to just have, you know, joined up policy, you know, have a point of contact for, for sort of all racetracks and all states and try to have the industry move together as one. You know, one of the things that I think hurts horse racing more than anything 
is the disputes that take place within the industry, within industry stakeholders. Like one of the things I always say is like, let's fight like hell behind closed doors, but we need to present a unified front to the public, to the to the world, to the industry. Um, and and I think I think there's starting to be some understanding of that. You know, we still have a couple of actors, actually just really one, um, you know, that's really, really opposing us. But I'm hoping that will soften over time as well because there's not a single person in horse racing that doesn't want uniformity, doesn't want the horse to be taken care of well, and doesn't want to have, you know, integrity enforcement in the sport. The disconnect is how you do that, you know, and, and, what, and what mechanisms you use and who does it. And so it's very much a trust issue, I think, is that a lot of people don't trust that Heise is going to come in and do things the right way in a way that's good for the industry. And we need to maintain the line of being a regulator, which means you always have to be a little bit distanced from your stakeholders and, and be objective and treat everyone the same. Yeah. But also build trust that our goals are your goals. You know, like we're in this together. And the other thing that I try to tell people is that, you know, racing commissions um, and gaming commissions, they're not always exclusively focused on horse racing. And they are state government employees. And they certainly work hard, but you know, they're, they're state government employees. So if you try to call them on a Saturday or a Sunday, they're often not available. You know, my people are, we are available 24 seven. I take calls at five in the morning, I take calls at 11 o'clock at night. You know, if somebody is trying to enter a race or there's some, there's some regulation in place that is not doing what it's supposed to do and is causing a problem, we address it immediately. We may not address it the way they want, but we address it immediately. We're there, we're, we're there to yeah. answer questions because we are completely 110% committed to horse racing. That's all we do, that's all we care about. So just having that dedicated resource, I think is really a game changer. And it's gonna take some time for everyone to really realize that. I think, I think we're, we're changing a lot of minds already, but you know, it's, it's trust and it's time. What have you learned that surprised you so far? Are there things that... So I think what I've learned, like the biggest thing I learned very quickly is um, how, diverse, and I don't mean in the conventional sense we talk about diversity, but mm -hmm. how different and diverse the stakeholder groups are and how challenging it is to create a rule that makes sense in Oklahoma, makes sense in New York, makes sense to owners, makes sense to, you know, to, to farriers. I mean, we cover so many stakeholder groups that finding that balance is really important. And sometimes I actually, you know, I fight battles on all sides, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes I have um, folks, you know, maybe California is an example, that come to me with a really compelling horse welfare rule, okay? And they want us to do it tomorrow. Like what, can you give me an example? Um, like for example, there are, there are rules in some states where you have to have, um, a horse examined by a veterinarian before you work a horse. Now every horse under highs is examined before they race. There's no question, okay? But in, in a number of states you have to have the horse examined before you even work. Like before which, they even go out to train? Correct. Wow. Okay, they have to have a, you know, a, a, vet. a vet veterinarian say that the horse can, can train. Um, in California, for example. Now, there is a dearth of equine veterinarians in this country. We are working hard with a lot of different stakeholder groups, universities, et cetera, to try to encourage veterinarians to go into equine, into equine health, but, but there aren't enough veterinarians. And in some states, like Ohio, you might have two, you know, regulatory veterinarians, you may have a certain number of, of, of attending veterinarians. So with that rule, if I were to impose that rule tomorrow across the country, not me, but if HISA were, and we have to wait for the, you know, the Federal Trade Commission, we haven't talked about that, but they're the, 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 the governing body that actually has to bless our all rules before they become rules. What we would basically be saying is 20 racetracks couldn't operate. You know, so we have to be pragmatic too because they wouldn't have the resources. They wouldn't have enough veterinarians okay. for that to, to act just from an operational standpoint, logistical standpoint to work. So we have to balance how can we deliver the best possible horse care within the resources that we have. Now we want to get there and we will get there over time. But we can't do it all tomorrow. And so there's a lot of pragmatism and consideration about how we take step forward that have to be considered. It can't always be, you know, um, that the, the perfect thing can be achieved tomorrow. You know, it, it's a work in progress and we've made tremendous progress. And when we think that something is generally, like it's, it's absolutely critical for equine health, then of course, 
we don't mm -hmm. take those considerations into, into account. But where we think it's something that would make things better, but, but doesn't necessarily have to happen tomorrow, we have to balance the interests of different states. And California may have a very different view than Oklahoma or, or Ohio. Yeah. And we've got to be in the middle kind of, you know, mediating all of that to That's some extent. very interesting. You know? Is there something that you think is, that you would steer to as being the biggest accomplishment so far for people that really aren't in the weeds with horse racing? Yeah. How would you describe that, you know, the things that HISA has implemented, changed, what have you, to really make a difference at this point? So one is um, that we mandated pre-race exams in, mm -hmm. in, every, in every state. That's definitely had a very meaningful impact on, on horse health. And so has, um, you know, people might not be, be familiar with the void with, with with claiming races, but claiming races are those races where you you actually you know can buy a horse in a race. The horse is in a ten thousand dollar claiming race. You can actually say, I want to buy a horse number three, and then you actually get that horse for ten thousand dollars if you're kind of number one mm -hmm. on the on the list. And um, what we've done is we've implemented um, a rule called the voided claim rule, which basically means I don't want to get technical. It basically means that if you're a horse, if you try to put a horse in a claiming race because it's, it's lame or it's got some medical issue, that's not gonna work. That, the, folks used to do that, you know? They'd figure out a way to get a horse in there, yeah. they, they might give it a little bit of medication so you couldn't tell. And then the, the buyer of the horse would have a horse that, that wasn't, wasn't well and that wasn't good for horses. So that's made a really big difference. The anti-doping program, I think, has made a huge difference. Um, you know, what I'm hearing from a lot of trainers is they really believe that it's leveling the playing field. You know, that essentially it is allowing um, the, the horses that really should win to actually win. Now, it's not, not doing that everywhere, like, you know, immediately, but, the, but it's really having, having that kind of impact. And more than anything, I actually think it's changed the consciousness, you know? It's changing culture. The culture being that medication isn't always the answer, mm -hmm. you know? To, to horse welfare that, that, you know, most of trainers are terrific at horsemanship and they can lean into that more. Um, and that's what a lot do. And it's just changing the thought process around how we, how we, how we develop horses for racing and how we keep them healthy, you know? And I think that's incredibly important because we need that, that mind shift, that cultural shift to really be able to implement these changes um, going forward. Yeah, I mean, it's about evolving, but that's yeah. so hard. It's so hard. And it's rare, it you know, is, it's yeah. rare that you get to watch a sport, people behind that sport that care about that sport really try to make it happen. Yeah. It is not, yeah. you know, so yeah. I think that that also is something that a lot of people can learn from just by understanding the process. I mean, are there things that you think have come into play for you that are key within your skill set? I mm. love how, Jenna Antonucci, the trainer that, that won the Belmont yeah. with Archangelo, you know, the quote that she had, if you, if you don't have your own table, make your own table, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. What about for you? Because I, yeah. I, I love that there are women that are really right. um, strong in this sport right now, too. Not that there weren't before, but yeah. just that are more at the forefront. Right. So there are a number of things for me that I think were kind of quintessential moments. Um, one is we decided to build the bespoke and doping agency, which is the Horse Racing Integrity and Welfare Unit. We had different options. We were, you know, uh, the statute, you know, required us to engage with USADA, which had done a terrific job kind of helping HISA get past and developing the culture around anti-doping and integrity. Um, but horse racing is really unique and it's different from human testing. And I just felt that to achieve, we wanted to achieve and to do it in a way that was nuanced enough to really be bespoke for horse racing, we needed to build it ourselves. And a lot of people fought me on that, you know? A lot of people thought that wasn't the right decision. Um, but I was really steadfast in believing that was the right path. And fortunately, I have an amazing board that really, you know, when I give a well thought out, you know, argument about why I think we should do something, they're really always very supportive, uh, which I'm very lucky for. So we went out to build this. And I truly believe um, we have built the most effective, professional, um, thoughtful, intelligent and doping unit that exists um, in, almost, in almost any sport. Because what we've done is we've taken testing, we've taken um, adjudication, we've taken laboratory uh, certification, all of those things, put them under one, one integrity unit. 
and that's only in place to do the best that it possibly can for racing. And the professionalism, I think, that, that's been deployed has been really excellent, and I, I know that we're going to be able to kind of be successful because we created it, and we can fix it when it doesn't work, and we can be really focused on the things that we want to achieve. So uh, that's something that I think was really a, a, a very significant game changer because these programs are so complicated, and you've got to, the magic of them is having the rigor, but with, with, with the nuance around the sport itself, and, and basically putting in place regulations that are strict enough and clear enough to protect the essential um, goals and principles of the sport mm -hmm. without taking away the magic or, or the beauty of it, you know? Like without destroying it. It's like sometimes when you go in to fix something, you gotta make sure you don't kind of kill it while you're, you know, sometimes they'll yeah. say like the surgery is worse than the cure or whatever it is. But that's really, um, that's really I think what we've tried to do. And I think it's been successful. We've got to continue to, you know, to improve it and listen and all that. But I think that's been really good. Because it sounds like it's sort of tailor-made. Yes, Right, exactly. and that's the difference. Exactly. So that's what it's you were fighting for. Yes. Is to do yes. that, because you were yes. aware of that. Yes, and I was aware of the, of the challenges we would face down the road. Um, the other thing I've done is I created a horseman's advisory group early on about a year ago, so that I would have a group of horsemen who were on the ground every day, doing this day in and day out, who I could tap into for advice. Because there, you know, one, of the, one of our big criticisms early on was that there weren't um, actual horsemen kind of involved in policy making. And the reason for that at the very beginning was one, the statute didn't allow you to own horses and be on the board or be on a committee. Um, so that obviously you know, disqualified a lot of horsemen, all horsemen, or at least all active horsemen. Um, and then also, you know, there's that gap with like they're really busy and they're doing what they do. So do they have the time to dedicate? And so I created this horseman's advisory group that um, I rely on very significantly for advice and suggestions and basically to bounce ideas off when I think that we're going to do something and to make sure that we've thought through the unintended consequences. That's always mm -hmm. a big one, right? It's like you do something mm -hmm. you think it's amazing, this is gonna fix everything, it's fantastic. And you're like, oh my god, it fixed that, but it created those three problems over here, you know? Yeah. And so that doesn't that doesn't help. And so I'm So is that like that a group. phone call or are you texting or are you? So we all have we have above? meetings like at least monthly. Okay. Um, but the way that I found it actually even more like helpful is I pick up the call and like I know what each member kind of you know, where they focus and what their expertise is, and so I often just pick up the call phone and say, what do you think of this, you know? Mm -hmm. And then I'll, I'll call four or five of them and try to get a consensus. Or I'll say, can I have a meeting of just the trainers or just the vets or just the owners? That's really um, cool. You know, and, and it's been really helpful. I've been very lucky with the, with the contributions there. It means a lot to me. Um, you know, the place where my father used to take me to watch racing was called Blue Bonnets. And um, I grew up in Montreal, Canada, and it was um, kind of a central place. It was only about a five, 10 minute drive from my home. Um, but it was something people gathered, and it was it was it was you know, people used the parking lot of Blue Bonnets to, you know, to to bring buses to go on trips or for for summer camp. It was like it was kind of a central location that people gathered, and um, and it it went out of business. It, it it is no longer there. It's been gone for about twenty years, and that's really um, that's heartbreaking for me because it had so many childhood memories, and so when I think about you know those early days and my father and Blue Bonnets, I think. That's, I don't want that to happen to horse racing generally. You know, There are a lot of racetracks that have closed, but the industry itself is still vibrant, it's still present, it still has tremendous potential, and we need to make sure that it doesn't happen um, mm -hmm. to the industry as a whole or to, to you know, our, our, even our more seminal racetracks. You know? what, what does that mean to your dad, what you're you doing? You know, he, um, he always talks about how much he misses it. Um, Fortunately, he's now part of that group that spends six months a year in Florida, and so he's, he's a very frequent visitor to Gulfstream. Um, constantly, actually, at Gulfstream, that's his big activity. Uh, and, you know, and also, like, funny enough, you know, he's getting older, his, you know, his mind is declining a little bit, he needs to keep sharp, and so I love when he goes because he's, like, handicapping, and it's really exercising his mind. It's so positive for him as opposed to sitting at home and taking a walk or watching mm -hmm. TV, you know? So there's so many benefits to horse racing. It's a, it's a very, people don't realize, like, if you're generally handicapping, it's kind of like baseball with statistics. Like, yeah. there's so much information and so much 
kind of brain activity that has to happen to do it well. Um, but I think that's also so valuable. I was at the Kentucky Derby with my father and I had to go run down and do something in mm -hmm. the paddock. And I, I left my dad at a table yeah. and he was handicapping. And I, I came back two hours later and he was in the same spot. <laughs> I was like, so <laughs> I, totally, same race, probably, right? I, I totally get it. And yeah. I, it's so fun. It's cool yeah. to watch. Yeah. Um, that's definitely in his blood and he yeah. loves it. But um, our general counsel, um, I always laugh because he's a huge handicapper. And I'm like, I'm never inviting you to a race again because he shows up with like a <laughs> pile of papers this big. I'm like, you're so boring. Like, I can't. You know what I mean? Like, like go over there. And he, and he says actually that when he goes to the racetrack, if he's going to actually gamble, he, he can't sit like with the general public. And see, he knows he has to like sequester himself in a room so he can do his work, um, which is really different from most sports, right? Yeah, it is. Yeah. And you have two kids. I do. Teenagers. Yes, teenagers. How, how do you balance this? How do you do it? What have you learned? So um, I've learned that women are really good at multitasking, which I'm sure you're very familiar with. Um, I sometimes laugh that I'll be, you know, sitting in like this huge meeting with very powerful, you know, industry players and and I'm getting a text, you know, can I have pliables? And I'm writing like, no, you know what I mean? <laughs> like in between giving like some, yeah. you know. Yeah. So you've got to, um, you know, being present for children is so important, um, but also I don't think I would be a good mother if I didn't if I didn't have the career that I have or or, mm -hmm. or, a, or a motivating career. Um, I remember when my son, who's the older one, he's actually a freshman in college. He's 18 now. When um when I had him and I did take a few, couple months off from the NFL for maternity leave, and I literally was like. I couldn't, somehow like we were, we barely got, were showered by like 3 p.m. Like I was really not good at that. Like I was, I just wasn't good at it. You know what I mean? Like I was not, and when I had somebody who came in who was wonderful to help me kind of do that day to day care, I could be just a much more present mother and a better mother. And I was like, people are just born to do, to do different things, you know? Yeah. So I'm, um, I'm very maternal, but I am just, I'm just a better version of myself when I'm, when I'm working. And they've come to understand that and come to respect it. And they obviously get some, you know, perks from, from what I do in terms of being mm -hmm. able to be around exciting people and see, you know, see sport and all that. Um, but, but I do, I mean, literally what it really ends up, what it ends up meaning is that 95% of your time is work and kids, you know, and I'm not trying to fit my husband in. Like, you don't have, what really yeah. ends up happening for me, because I do spend a ton of time with my kids, you know, in between, is that I don't have a lot of space for my friends or mm -hmm. activities or other things. You know, I have two sisters who live in my town, so fortunately I have them because it's easier to kind of see them and drop That's it on great. them and all that, which I love. I'm very close to my sisters. But that's a different, you know, just a different, different thing. What's your happy place away from the work, whether it's with your family or what is, what is it that you guys do together that you, that fills you up? Yeah, I think um, my happiest place is definitely being, um, being with my family and, um, you know, I love, my son's always been an athlete and so, you know, I've loved uh, kind of watching him play sports and including my daughter, we would sort of, when we lived in Singapore, this was actually the best, he would, you know, he would play in like soccer tournaments, baseball tournaments in like, you know, Australia and Hong Kong and Thailand and so we had all these like awesome trips around watching him play sport and I really, wow. really love that. You know, obviously when you come back to the U.S., you're going over to like Pennsylvania right, and stuff. Right. But, um, but, um, right. But yeah, I mean, those are the kinds of things um, I really love, and you know, family dinners when I can make it happen, you know, and and conversation, and um, yeah, I mean, that's really, you know, I love just just being with my family because we lived overseas so much, we've yeah. gotten to explore a lot of different, you know, neat places. And that was probably a really cool time too to bond with the unit, yes. right? Yeah, I think exactly. Just like you said, I think family dinners when you can do them, because God knows everybody can't, right? Not everybody no, can either. or all and, the time. And to be honest, I mean, I would be lying to you if I told you it was frequent. I mean, yeah. especially now I've got one in college and my daughter definitely doesn't think that conversation at the dinner table at 13 with me is very, like, an interesting activity. <laughs> <laughs> She'd much rather, you know, have a, one friend on FaceTime and one doing something else and while she's, you know, yeah. speeding herself. So you go through the teenage girl thing, you, you'll get there. You'll, you'll, you gotta you'll, do what you can. You, you do what you can. With the Breeders' Cup coming up, the one, the one question or the thing that I hear from people who aren't necessarily dialed into horse racing or maybe don't know a lot about it, or maybe they do, but for people out there that say that they can't watch it because mm -hmm. of just unexplained horse deaths, mm -hmm. okay, or horses going down, you're, you're dialed into every aspect of mm -hmm. it. 
what would you say? What do you tell people that have that opinion? Yeah. And that's a, I know it is a multi-layered answer. It's a multi-layered answer. But what I, mo what I would mostly say is um, we put tremendous effort into creating an ecosystem of care around the horse. Um, that has been something that Haiza has been very diligently at work at in partnership with other industry stakeholders. And it's something that is taking a little bit of time to develop, but people can feel comfortable that there is tremendous scrutiny on these horses, that there is scrutiny on the surfaces. We now have a track supervisory, you know, supervisory group that looks at surfaces and, and is called in when there's an issue. We have um, a post-entry screening process, which means we look at all of the horses, their history in addition to the veterinary exams. So we really built out, I like to call it the ecosystem of care that didn't exist previously in that unified way. Um, and I'm really confident in our people and our processes now. Can we, can we eliminate every single eventuality? Probably not. We're going to die trying. Probably not. But I think we've made tremendous, tremendous progress. And, and the thing is, is that everybody in the industry understands it and understands the importance. And everybody is working together in general to make it happen. And so, you know, when, when, when the Kentucky Derby took place, we hadn't yet launched our anti-doping program. You know, that came on May 23rd mm -hmm. of, of the same month. So we, we need a little bit of time, obviously, to get going, to have our procedures actually have an impact. But I really, I see that they are now, and I also see a consciousness around horse safety that has really developed um, and, has, and is really in focus for people. And people aren't going to take risks. You know, they, they just aren't. These horses, they love to do what they love to do. I mean, no 600-pound animal is going gonna, is gonna to run if it doesn't want to run, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and these horses are genuinely loved and cared for. And there are a lot of trainers who always say, you know, if you have any concerns or questions, like, come to the backside. Come watch me with my horses. Come see what we do. Come see what it looks like. Um, and I think those that take the time to do that are, you know, are, are reassured. I really do. Is there, if there's a power that you wish you had, that you could mm -hmm. move forward with, what would that be within this sport? If there's something that you do wish you had the power to do? This, if, when you first said power, I thought you meant like superpower, and I was gonna say, I wish I had like, you know, the ability to look at every horse and see, you know, mm -hmm. what, what was wrong in a way that, you know, we're limited to some extent by our technology and our processes. Um, but I think it's a power that we, have already but we use lightly which is the power to um when i say use lightly is that we're still developing it but i think over time we, we will have an ability to use this power more more dramatically more focused but to make sure that every racetrack in this country deserves to have horses run at that racetrack um because at this point you know horsemen and the veterinarians they're doing their part and when I first took this job, I thought, you know, every racetrack, I don't want a single racetrack to close under my watch, you know? But actually, for horses to be safe and for horses to, to I think, be appreciated, the, the venue has to live up to our safety requirements and our goals and our vision. And if you can't, then you shouldn't have the privilege of racing horses. It is a privilege, you know? It is absolutely a privilege and an honor. And if we are going to have these animals run, we've got to give them the best possible environment, the best possible care, and do everything in our power to make sure that they're safe. And I think that the ability to, to really have the power to mandate that from racetracks, something mean, we're still developing, um, but that's really important to me going forward. What do you think horse racing is going to be in the next five, 10 years? I genuinely believe that we are going to take a massive step forward. I really do. Because I really believe that if we can show the public that these animals are well, well cared for, that they're happy, that there's um, just a real focus on their welfare, that they're going to take their focus off of that issue and be able to appreciate all the value and the benefits of the sport. And I think the sport is really incredible. And so I think if we can address that issue well, that the sport is going to thrive. Uh, and you know, it's funny because people talk about, you know, kids in our generation our demogra and the demographic of our children is their attention spans are very short. Well, every horse race is like two minutes. It's perfect. <laughs> it's, it's like, 
<laughs> I mean, I, my, my son can focus for two minutes on, on, on a horse race. So we have a, f a compelling, amazing product with all the data yeah. that we're bringing in and wearables and that. It's, it can get so much more exciting and with all of the data that's available. And so if we can just deal with those concerns, those red flags, I think the focus can be on the beauty of the sport. I think also part of evolving is um, transparency. For sure. And yeah. because as you're talking about that with kids, my mind immediately went to when I had my family in Saratoga and it was a lovely day. And then, yeah. you know, at the end horse, of yeah, that, the race terrible. before the last, the, um, the horse went down, Maple Leaf yeah. Mel. And where it happened is right, I mean, right in front of the grandstand, yeah. as yeah. you know. And yeah. so what I remember is just the roar of the crowd turning into this gasp, right? Yes. And then, but then also, looking around and just seeing people with tears in their eyes and then my kid and I did not expect obviously you don't expect that's going right. to happen but my kids saying what are they doing now right? right and then you realize okay so you have to explain yeah. Yeah. what they're doing on the track and the transparency is so important I think for for all of that too right. and to 100%. to understand how that moment impacts all the people not just the people that are watching the trainer who loves yeah. that horse, who yeah. you know, and but all the pieces that are around it. Yeah, it's no, it's I, a hard. I, I thing. agree a hundred percent. I mean, it reminds me a little bit of the NFL. You know, there was a period um, not too long ago where there was so much public concern about concussions, and could you play the game safely? Like, could you go watch an NFL game? Yeah, and I think they've addressed that really well. You know, with a lot of focus on on concussions and, and how they're caused and, and new rules, and they've evolved the sport and. While it's not perfect, I think people have been okay assured that, you know, they can go back to watching without that same degree of concern, you know, mm -hmm. um, because of new equipment, because of new procedures, et cetera. And we need to be able to do something similar in horse racing. But we've got to do it ethically and sincerely, you know. The one thing that I, I talk about a lot with my team is we can't, it can't be window dressing, you know. I think what we've seen is that if the public thinks you're acting, you're actually doing real stuff yes. to have a real, real impact, they'll give you some rope and they'll give you some time to get it done. If they think you're just saying, oh, we're doing all this over here, but we really just care about the money, you lose all, you lose all respect. And um, also that the younger generation coming up is 100%. even more dialed in For because sure. of all the things, because of social media, but with, with exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. I think yeah. that's crucial. It, it really is, and, and that's what we're spending so much time now is you know, what our response is to, to the Churchill fatalities and how we implement, you know, these changes and, and, these, and these initiatives and in a way that, like, really makes a difference. You know, like, where do we put our resources? What is the, what is the data telling us? And, and I think, you know, I think we've got a lot of really amazing ideas and things in the pipeline that are going to continue to make things better and better. And if we just get a couple of years to be able to really completely roll everything out, um, that we're going to be in a much better place. So, right, so it's a building thing. Are there yeah. things that will be in place implemented for the Breeders' Cup that weren't there before that you can point to? So we are going to implement our post-entry screening process, mm -hmm. which is when we essentially use the Heise of Veterinarians to do a thorough review of a number of data points of the horse's history. They can then arm the regulatory veterinarian, who's the one who's actually ex you know, examining the horse's yeah. pre-race, with all the information. because. What used to happen in a lot of places is that you're, exam you know, you're, you're going you're gonna to examine like a, a large number of horses on race day. So you don't necessarily have the time or the, or the resources to have a full history on each horse. Um, if something major has happened, you'll know, but like you don't necessarily know. And there are a number of things that our data has now shown us are risk factors for injury. And so we flag those ahead of time. And so that a regulatory veterinarian can have a full view. Now, he or she may still think that horse is fine. That horse may be totally fine to run. But at least they have all of the information and they have the horses of interest, we call it. And we found that that, that process um, is extremely impactful. We used it the last week in Saratoga. And we predicted, like I think it was something like 80% of the horses um, that were of concern and managed to avoid them racing. We're going to be implementing that, and the Breeders' Cup is just so supportive of horse welfare. I mean, they're so dedicated um, and focused on it. And obviously, Santa Anita in California is a leader, um, really, in, in, in horse safety. And so I think all the right ingredients are in place. Um, but it will be the first Breeders' Cup under our anti-doping program, so that's also mm -hmm. exciting. You know, more pre-race testing, um, you know, more scrutiny. Um, around the anti-doping, and we have an investigations team that will be be there. So I just think we have more resources um, 
can play here than we've had before. Is it that horses are randomly screened? Is it just like NFL? It's everything. Like it's, it's random, it's post-race, it's winners, it's, it's a whole lot of horses, you know, um, that are being, there's also intelligence-based, that there's a reason that our investigations team believes that a particular horse should be tested at a particular time, then, then that will happen. Um, wow. You know, so there's a whole lot of tools in place to, 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 to make sure that we're maintaining that ecosystem of care and we're protecting, we're protecting the horses and, and consequently the sport. Be honest, what was more challenging? Is it um, the NFL or is it horse racing? Well, obviously in the position I'm in, certainly horse racing. But but overall, I mean, there's a lot of um, you know. One, I, I like to think about my time at the NFL because I had so many great you know mentors there. I mean, actually, I was Roger Goodell's like first mentee when we launched the NFL mentoring program, and he was he wasn't commissioner then, but he was fantastic. And I've had a lot of really good people, Jeff Pash, who have really helped me to kind of think about things. And I think one of the, and Paul Tagib was the commissioner, and he was yes. really just an incredibly cerebral um, strategic thinker and you know the NFL has I think in a lot of ways the same tensions that we have which is that the the kind of battle between you know tradition and innovation you know like you want to protect the core elements of the sport but you want to bring in common day you know current day sensibilities and current day you know technology and all of that and one of the things that I hear a lot of people that don't like Kaiser or are scared is you're getting rid of horsemanship. You know, you're getting rid of the essence of the sport. That is the absolute thing we don't want to do, you know? Mm -hmm. And that is what we're sort of fighting for. We're fighting for how do we preserve the best things about it while getting rid of the things that are actually detrimental and, and presenting it in a way that is consistent with the ethics and social mores we have today, which are different than they were 100 years ago, you know? Yeah. And so we can't ignore that because if we do, we'll be obsolete. But we also can't forget what made horse racing so special. And I think probably every sport has, I think with the NFL because that's my experience, but probably every sport has that, you know, that conundrum, mm -hmm. that balancing test. Um, but I think about that a lot because I, we can't get away from, or we, can't, we can't get so far away from what makes horse racing amazing. Um, that we kind of sort of ruin it, but we also can't only have, we need meaningful change and meaningful kind of mind shift and meaningful kind of cultural, I think, um, just revision. And so finding that balance and figuring out the magic of where that lands, that's probably the most complicated part of leading any sport. You Do you know? have a measuring stick of what that would look like for you? Yeah, the measuring stick for me is relatively simple in that you know, we're still around in three, four years from now, and people are talking way less about safety and far more about who won the last race and who's the best trainer and, you know, what horse they should bet on, you know? Mm -hmm. Success for me means no stories about safety, you know? And certainly means no horses, you know, getting injured. Thank you, Lisa. Is there anything else you'd like to say? That was a long um, conversation. <laughs> I know. Is there, I just... I you know, when I see you and I see your interest, that makes me very hopeful, you know, because oh, so you nice. come from, well, it's true, you come from a history, obviously, where you have a connection to horse racing, mm -hmm. but you're, you're still committed to it, you're still interested in it, and, and I think you understand, like, that connection between sort of horse and trainer, um, and you tell the stories really well, and it's so important that we have people who can kind Thanks. of take it from, from this generation to the next. That's, thank you very much. I just I do think there's so much to learn mm -hmm. from being around all the different parts of it, you know. Yeah. And it certainly is. I took for granted the history and how deep it. To your point, you said this. It seems to go for everybody involved. Yeah. And the amount of people that say it was my dad. Yeah. You know, and I'm sure there are people that say it was their mom who got yeah. them interested. But yeah. there's just something about that, you know. Yeah. It's like okay. It, it's a really special thing to understand and, to, and so thank you for yeah. the access yeah. been behind the scenes and explaining. Thank you. Very cool. It's a lot of fun. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> thank you. Look forward to seeing you in the Peter's Cup. I really enjoyed hearing about Lisa's path and how all the things that she's done up until now she felt really prepped her for this role that she's in and make no mistake I mean the task ahead of her is really challenging um, and it's going to take time. She kept saying that so I just, I learned so much in this conversation. I hope that if you follow horse racing, I hope you learned something. If you don't, I hope that if you have more questions that you will 
you know, interact with me that we can find the answers to those questions together. Uh, and as always, I would love it if you like and subscribe to my channel. If you're watching on YouTube, if you're listening wherever you get your podcasts, please let me know what you think. Um, leave a review. Don't forget to subscribe and let me know what you'd love to hear more of. So thanks for watching and listening. Thank you, Lisa, for the time. And I'll see you next time for some more Lunch with Lindsay.